Our next storyteller is Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP. He has words on the power of this moment in our time. He was with us earlier this morning and taped his story ahead, and he now will share it with you. Thank you, Megan. So as an African-American male uh, in this country, we become keenly aware of the social construct of race. I can recall growing up in Detroit uh, in middle school and watching a PBS special that was just released called Eyes on the Prize. And sitting there watching this storyline, and it was a five part series if I can uh, recall. And it had the images of people demonstrating black and white footage and this particular scene caught my attention. It was a very young boy, he was probably my age or younger, in the midst of the demonstration, or he could have been innocently there. And the police at the time had dogs attacking him and he was crawling back. And it went from there to another storyline of the fire holes and it, the high pressure of the fire holes pushing people against the wall. And the storyline went on. It's an important history, but for me at that time, I became so enraged watching those images, understanding that these individuals were simply trying to march for freedom. And that's what all the signs said, march in peace or march for freedom. And out of nowhere, I was standing up on the couch, punching air, just, just in rage, fear, in fear, just... It was fascinating now that I think about it. And so when the Breonna Taylor uh, decision came down, I was doing an interview and the reporter asked me, how do you feel in hearing? And I said, you know, for far too many of us, we have low expectation that the justice system will be just for us and or our community. And the disappointing decision of the grand jury not to charge a single officer for the murder of Breonna Taylor, but only to charge one officer for shooting and the bullet lodging through a neighbor's apartment. I didn't get as enraged as I did the day I was on that couch in the living room, but as a constant reminder that the system of justice it's not always just for African Americans. And matriculating through high school and, and finding myself in college in Mississippi and HBCU, Tougaloo College, and turning on the screen one evening only to see the evening news report of a black man being beat by multiple police officers with batons. He wasn't resisting, he was just curled up and it was a Rodney King incident. And I can recall watching that image and reacting the very same way I did when I was in middle school, punching air, just frustrated of this unfortunate reality that there is no compassion, no empathy for Black people as human beings in this country for far too many individuals. It also takes me to the time that I was driving my first, my first car and, and in a seven day period that week, I was pulled over every day by the same two officers and they performed the same routine of checking the car as if I was a drug dealer. Now, what was unique about this car, it was a, it was a, it was a beat up old car, had a floor, I had a hole in the floor. And one of the times they pulled me over, my friend, we had just graduated from high school, he was in the police academy. And he was like, officer, I'm in the police academy. And then they pat him down and he was just issued a service revolver. And there was a media reaction he said, I'm in the police academy. And they looked at the badge and they gave it back to him. No explanation. They went away. And that last day when they went to pull me over and I was pulled up in front of my house and my mother was like, what, what are you pulling him over for him now? You've done this all week. Only to fast forward, after the Rodney King incident, there was a young man on my street on 23rd and Warren by the name of Malice Green, who had been beat 
by these same two officers. The level of expectation of a justice system that truly provides justice for African Americans is an unfortunate narrative that spans decades. It's a narrative that requires more of us to do things that are necessary to ensure that equal protection under the law is afforded to everyone. Whether it's the four little girls that are being bombed in Birmingham, and that this, who, who would think that someone would bomb a church and you have four girls in there, choir rehearsal, Sunday school, Bible study, whatever the case may be. Or Charleston, South Carolina, Dylan Ruth, and he go and he massacre individuals who are there for Bible study. To get arrested and the law enforcement officers treat him with more dignity that individuals who have been murdered and committed no crime, and they took him to Burger King so he can have a meal before they take him uh, into custody. It's a level of reality that far too many individuals have to live with, but it's a responsibility in this moment to change that narrative. In this moment, create a new value proposition that's inclusive of all of the citizens of this country, not just some. The social construct of race has had a, a, a impact on this nation's psyche in a way in which far too many people are being impeded to really accomplish their true potential. And how that feels to me personally is something that oftentimes I would find myself punching air because now I have children and I pray that they will have children. And at some point we have to break this cycle of this value proposition is that if you are born in this nation and you are African-American or you are seen as other, that your life is irrelevant. It simply don't matter. The factual statement that Black Lives Matter is not an a statement to exclude anyone. It's a factual statement because far too many individuals who have been charged with the responsibility to protect and serve, far too many individuals who who get elected to office to design public policy to impact all of us, disregard that our lives also have value and it matters. It's an opportunity for this nation to finally come to terms with the value proposition. Race is a social construct if you really think about the history of this nation, because in the 1900s and 1920s, if you was Irish, in Boston or in the New England states, you were not considered white. If you was Jewish in the same period of time in many parts of this country, you were not considered white. Race is such a social construct that is a political calculation or who would be accepted into this quote, white caste system based on the need to maintain power, domination, and control. And at some point, we must break the caste system. We as a nation could never really achieve our full potential if we suffocate the opportunities of a large set of individuals. How that feel to me is, is a feeling that propels me to do the work that I have been doing and recognize that the work of freedom for all citizens is a continuum. It is that compelling, that motivating fact to say, if we lack the integrity, the ability, the empathy to truly hold the constitutional principles that all men and women are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. A social contract that should be afforded to all citizens, a social contract that would treat non-citizens with respect and dignity. It is something that compels me to do the work that I do. It's something that compels me to question those who react in such a visceral response as if 
we are equated to Klansmen who seek to maintain a social construct that oftentimes demean them as individual, but use them as puppets in a larger game. Working poor whites are victims of the same system. Middle income whites are victims of the same system. It is a system that we must abolish in this moment by moving people from the peaceful protest in the streets, which is very necessary to bring attention to social justice. If there were no peace protests in the streets, many of us would have never heard the name Breonna Taylor. If there were no peaceful protests in the streets, many of us would not have known the name of John Lewis, an ordinary individual who did some extraordinary things. And that's why I do what I do, because of standing up on that couch in middle school, punching air, because I see the injustice that was being done. Not to adults. He was a little boy where the police were seeking an attack dog on. A little girl that was simply being placed in a school to integrate schools in a, a violent mob yelling profusely to this child who was no more than the fifth, sixth, or seventh grade. This moment calls us to do something different. But it's because of moments like these that have led me to do the work that I have done and I've spent my life working towards equal protection under the law and a level of equality that we strive for. We are at an inflection point. We must decide, are we going to move to the future for a prosperous opportunity where our elderly are treated treated with care and dignity, that our young people are provided a quality education, not the political hurdles that we currently see where young people born in a certain zip code are denied a, a full opportunity. And will we do away with this social construct and provide equal protection under the law and protect the rights of those who are disadvantaged, however we define disadvantage? Thank you.